much. Um, so offensive tradecraft, defensive evasion. Um, so there's two main objectives uh, with this talk. The first one is to try to understand the actual challenge of developing malwares and subsequently to execute them on endpoints. So the first thing. And the second thing is to go through uh, multiple techniques that are already used by malwares and that can also be implemented in all your malwares, if you want, um, to actually bypass some defense mechanism. Um, so some information about myself. So my name is Paul Lane. I'm security consultant in London for context information security for a year and seven months, something like that. Um, so I'm involved in uh, simulated attack operation, routine operations kind of thing, and all the doing uh, research engine development to build the malware and tools that we're using. Um, my main interests are around Windows system internals, uh, .NET, and all the malware development. Uh, so if you're interested, I wrote two publications on the context blog, uh, one about the anti malware scan interface bypass, where I'm going through the internals of AMC, and all you can bypass it by doing so in memory patching. Uh, and another one about the common language runtime hook for persistence, so how you can leverage uh, the common language runtime to actually get persistence on a system and also to execute arbitrary C sharp code. Um, all right. So, why I'm here today, uh, why this presentation? Because basically, all the information already online, well, there's a lot of information online, there's a lot of really smart people that already wrote blog posts, uh, release malware and source code. Uh, but because they are online, there's a lot of signature around it. And uh, although it's not because information is online that it means that it's easy to understand it. Um, and the thing is, nowadays, regardless of what we think, defenders are more trained, they are more aware of the TTPs, they are more aware of what's going on. Um, and therefore, this is way more difficult for us to actually build malware and deploy them on endpoints and get co-execution. So um, a quick slide about VX Underground. So this is a website. Uh, so if you're interested about papers around techniques used by, by malware, and although a lot of malware samples, uh, I encourage you to have a look at this website uh, because there's tons of information, basically. A couple of caveats before we actually jump into um, uh, the meat of this talk is I really want to highlight the fact that nothing is fully undetectable. Uh, techniques are not civil bullets. So that's really going to depend on the environment in which you're going to execute your malware and how you're going to develop it. So you can use those techniques that may help you bypass AV and EDR, as we're going to see later, but it's not because you implement a specific technique that means that you're going to bypass all of them. There is EDR that are better at some specific things, and uh, you always need to adapt, basically. Uh, all, the, all the examples, so the example will be in C++, and everything will be uh, for Microsoft Windows. The reason why Microsoft Windows is because most of the, of the, of the targets, or actually most of the endpoints that we're going to target, uh, if you attack a company up, mostly running on Windows. Uh, it's pretty rare to have like Linux environment. Um, more and more Mac, but mostly Windows. Uh, and although, yeah, I just have an hour with you, so uh, unfortunately I'm not gonna be able to go too much in depth on all you can implement these techniques. So the idea is just to give you a, a rough idea of what it is, and then you can do extra research if you're interested about it. Okay, so first question is, what do we need for a malware campaign? Uh, I mean, we are not just developing a malware. It's not just a simple piece of software that we're deploying. There's a lot of thing around it. And the first thing is a command and control infrastructure. And here we have a, an example of a basic command and control infrastructure. Uh, so we are using a cloud infrastructure, which is the, the, the red box. And we have two victims that were infected by our malware. They're going to communicate back to a C2 infrastructure with a channel, that is the medium that we're going to use to communicate with, with our implant. And in this case, we have two redirectors, so we're going to have two different domain names. So if one is cut, well, we can keep communicating with, with our infrastructure. And uh, we can respin them as much as we want. We can have as much redirector as we want. And we also have like a, a web server and a MERS server, which will, will be used for uh, the malware delivery uh, or like a fake website for search engine uh, rated thing. And obviously, we're going to connect as operator. We're going to connect to a C2 server in which we're going to uh, control everything. Uh, 
So we have an infrastructure, you know, we need our actual malicious code uh, or, or code that's going to execute on endpoints. So we don't want everything in the same file, in the same binary, in the same, um, in the same document. Why we don't want that? Because if we are caught, we are losing all our entire property, we're losing all the work, and this is definitely not what we want. And also because if we implement a lot of things, so if we implement a packer, if we implement a defense mechanism and stuff like that, we're going to end up with a file that is quite big or with a lot of code and a lot of things. So instead, we want to use a staging system. We want to split and keep it as modular as possible. So we will focus mostly on stage zero because this is the first uh, and real lightweight file and executable that we, or, or document that we're going to send to the target. And this is where we're actually going to implement all defense evasion to assess whether or not it's safe to continue and to download the stager and then execute it. And uh, this stage zero will execute in memory uh, or not, depending on what you're doing, with the stage one. And then the stage one will be uh, responsible for merging a robust communication to maintain a persistence and a reliable access to the endpoints. And then if you want to do more specific tasks, uh, you're going to use a stage two, which can also be known as a module, which is for persistence, uh, more persistence, if you want to do reconnaissance and things like that. So you keep everything modular to ensure that if only one piece of your work is detected, is flagged, is quarantined, whatever, you're not losing everything. So example of stage zero, uh, the most well-known one is probably office document. Uh, so you're going to send an office document with a VBA macro or a dy uh, dynamic data exchange uh, with da dynamic data exchange GDE. Or maybe just uh, something interesting is .NET click once application. Uh, or for um, legacy thing, maybe Java application, Java web application, stuff like that. All right, so we have an infrastructure where all the have our, uh, our malware, or let's say all different modules that we're going to deploy. We also need a communication channel technique. We need a way to receive information and send information. We need to send tasks and receive the outputs of those tasks. So to that, we're going to implement a channel. So the most used channel is HTTP and HTTPS. Why HTTP and HTTPS? Just because we want to blend into a network. We don't want to implement a custom protocol. Why? Because most of the, of the, of the company nowadays would detect that, oh, there's a random TCP port that is just sending egress traffic and that's probably going to be detected. So the reason why uh, most used communication channel will be over DNS or HTTP and HTTPS. If it's internal communication, it can go through like SMB pipes and have SMB uh, communication, communication through SMB pipe. But something that is interesting is that although nowadays we are using public services more and more, or at least APT, leverage uh, publicly accessible APIs from public services to actually communicate. So uh, using Twitter API, Discord API, Slack, or Pretty much anything that is publicly accessible you can use to send and receive data. Um, and the technique is basically all you're going to implement it. So you can have like inbound and outbound shell where you're going to keep the connection open all the time, which is not necessarily a good idea because you're going to send a lot of data and you're going to create a lot of traffic. Uh, but you can also use beaconing, which is a popular technique because this is the one used by default by CobraStrike if you're using CobraStrike. Uh, but you also can use like long polling when you're going to uh, kind of be cunning, but you're going to maintain the connection open for a specific amount of time and you're going to close it. Or dead drop where the initial um, address of the C2 or your infrastructure redirector on a public location, you're going to get this information and then you're going to use it to communicate and use another technique. All right, so now that we have all that, we need to deliver it. This is kind of the social engineering part of our, of our malware campaign. So we need a method. We need a way to actually deploy, send this, uh, this malware, this thing. Um, so the mostly used technique is obviously emails, through sh phishing emails. So you're going to send an email um, to, to employees, to, to your target, basically, um, with a, an attachment, which is not necessarily a great idea, especially if they're using uh, email gateway, but you can send like a, a link to a fake website. There's going to be like a fake SharePoint uh, that mimic a, an internal SharePoint uh, website, and, and you're going to just have your malware here and um, wait them to download it. If you have physical access to your location, you can use USB keys. Uh, just leverage the fact that you know people are probably going to try to 
to read what's in, especially if it's like HR data or something juicy. Um, or all the public services, why not? Uh, like if there's a HR team or HR mar or a marketing team that are actually using LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or whatever, why not just contacting them directly from there and uh, send a CV, which is a malicious office document or something like that. And the pretext is basically anything that's gonna untie the, the target's the victim to click, download, or, or do the initial actions that are required to execute your file. So now, what about the detection capabilities? Because here, we, we define what, what we need to develop, all the, all the things that we need to create uh, to, to start to initialize this, this mild campaign. But what about all the um, detection capabilities? So the thing is, uh, indicator of compromise is a pretty well-known word. Uh, but basically, what's an, an IOC? An IOC is any piece of information or data that can lead to the identification or potential identification of a compromise. Um, so, for example, network communication, is there any egress traffic to a newly created domain name? This is not normal. Uh, is there any egress traffic to through a custom protocol that was never used before in an environment? That kind of thing can, in, can potentially uh, ind indicate uh, a, a compromise. Uh, system logs, someone logged in, logged out, uh, there's maybe hack on that are locked out. That kind of thing. Artifact would be if there is any backdoor, dropper, or blob of data that were used by a malware somehow that's still in memory or that's still on the system. And uh, the TTPs, or let's say the abnormal behaviors, is like if there's any privilege escalation, UAC bypass, if there's any out of working hours traffic and, and activity, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and the idea is like all those IOCs are then used to improve the detection and response because we can, we can shape this IOC into rules. So like Yara or Sysmon rules that then can lead, that can be used and implemented on software to say, look, if on, the, on an endpoint, this specific action are, are carried out by someone, this leads to the, well, that, that's going to indicate that someone is using this specific malware or this specific technique. And then the SOC team can investigate that, um, quarantine the device if they want, and then investigate that. And obviously, the uh, IOC are, are used to, to create uh, AV signatures. Um, antiviruses, I think uh, all of you know what's an antivirus. Uh, but basically, the, the duty of an antivirus is to detect, is to block, and to remove a threat. That's what they're doing. And to do that, they are carrying out two types of analysis, a dynamic and a, and a static one. Dynamic can also be known as behavioral analysis. But the idea uh, and, and the problem of antivirus is like they mostly rely on, on, on signature-based detection. Um, same thing for next-generation antiviruses, which are supposed to be better, but at the end, uh, you can have machine learning, you can use IE. At the end, that's always going to be kind of the same thing. So if you go custom, if you create your own thing, or if you use already um, known malware and you just tweak them a bit, uh, you're probably going to end up being able to get execution on your, on your endpoint. This is why EDR are in use, and this is why EDR are really useful, is because endpoint detection and response uh, will provide real-time visibility uh, and forensic information about the endpoints. So they're going to be able to provide information such as parent process structure or process action, what's going on, which process was created, uh, which process was created and when it was created, the arguments and all this information that um, afterwards can be, can be monitored and, 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 and used to identify whether or not something malicious was, was um, I'm going on the system. Uh, but there can be all the file access information. Uh, there is any newly created file uh, or document that is dropped into, into a disk, into a temporary location. Network events, again, abnormal network traffic. Um, or system notification. Oh, this, this program is creating a new registry key or deleting one or modifying one. All those things uh, that can be a concern malicious. And, um, and, the, and, the, and the important thing also about EDI is that they're able to correlate data across an environment rather than just being focused on a single endpoint. Um, so they're going to be able to identify whether or not this uh, new protocol that is in use in this dev environment is, is abnormal or not, um, rather than in the HR department, for example. Um, and Sandbox. So Sandbox, again, I think uh, most of you should know, well, not should, but know what it is. Um, but the basically, a sandbox is a control environment in which any entrusted or a known document uh, will, will, be, uh, will be checked. So we're just 
put this file into a sandbox, we analyze it in different ways, and we, and we assess whether it's as malicious or not. And the idea of a sandbox is to be as, to, to mimic a user-like environment. So to, to make like a fake, uh, employee environment, basically. All right, so now that we know all that, uh, let's have a look at all the different steps, uh, roughly, uh, before getting co-execution if we actually send all malware. So, as we can see, that's a, a pretty long road, uh, to be honest. But let's start by the big, from the beginning. So, we send an email. This email contain a link to a fake SharePoint website that we are hosting on a cloud infrastructure. And uh, on this website, we have all malware that is just like sitting here and waiting to be downloaded and executed. So we send this email. This email, we go through an email getaway. And the email getaway through multiple rules, blacklist, whitelist, approach, or whatever, we ask this whether or not this is a malicious one. If it's a malicious one, where the domain name will be blocked or the IP will be blocked, and it's done. We can't execute our code. However, if it's considered as a clean, we're going to send any attachment or any further related to this email to the sandbox. And sandbox will do the same. Ask as a file. Check if it's a, a malicious or not. If it's malicious or not. If it's malicious, the signature of this file or all those files will be saved. And then again, domain will be blocked if there's any network communication. Um, so if it's not, the email will be delivered to the, uh, to the end users. So the end user will receive this email in their, in their, end in their, in their mailbox. And again, they're going to have to open this email. Um, if we are good at social engineering, they're probably going to click on a, on a website. They're going to land into this website, and then they're going to download the file. And at this point, the file will touch the disk. So what's going to happen? Um, the uh, antivirus that is installed on the system will start doing a static analysis of the file. If the static analysis result on a file being malicious, well, the file will be blocked. Well, the file will be quarantined, the AV will raise an alert, the file will be removed too, and uh, the EDR at this point, because EDR have visibility on this, on, on this whole section, on this whole environment. Um, so the AV alert will be sent to the EDR, the EDR will send that to the, to the SOC team, and SOC team will be like, oh, what's going on? And they're going to be able to investigate that. And again, we don't have code execution. And finally, uh, the user is kind enough to actually execute a code. Um, and what's going to happen? Well, we're going to have another analysis. We're going to have a dynamic analysis of this file. So during runtime, they're going to execute it. And again, if it's malicious, the file will be, uh, the AV will raise an alert. The file will be blocked. The signature will be saved. EGR will raise an alert. And we don't have code execution. But if we don't, and if at this point the dynamic analysis results in the file not being malicious, we're going to get, get code execution. And at this point, we're going to get a beacon back. We're going to get a, a communication back to a C2 infrastructure, and we're going to start being able to actually do stuff. However, we need to bear in mind that at this point, because they have an EDR, they always, they, they're going to have all the information related to the execution of this, of this file. So they're going to have the process tree. They're going to have the network events and everything. So if on the SOC team, they have rules again, that kind of thing, or what we're actually doing, the execution will not be locked, will not be blocked. However, they're going to have an alert and they're going to identify that manually. And if they identify that manually, they're going to be able to uh, trace back to us and then, well, again, we lose access. So roughly, there's like three major parts that are quite the most important ones. So we need, uh, we have the sandbox analysis, we have the static uh, antivirus analysis and the dynamic antivirus analysis. So Again, we can see that can be quite difficult nowadays with all those tools and, and people that are actually trained to detect this kind of thing to get code execution and a persistent access to a target. So roughly what they are looking for uh, is some uh, example what they're actually looking for and doing. So for the uh, static analysis, what they're looking for, obviously, file hash, file name, uh, VBA macros, if this is office documents, uh, but static strings too, if there's any uh, hard-coded credentials or hard-coded like um, domain name uh, that was already used uh, in a previous uh, malware campaign. If it's PE file, they're going to check for a lot of things like uh, the headers, the section, the link libraries, and all the stuff. And for the dynamic, there's way a lot of stuff. Um, Mostly about network communication, which is a, a big part of it. Uh, process information, uh, so child, uh, parent child, uh, parent child relationship, uh, common line arguments, and, and this kind of stuff. So, at this point, we know that it's quite difficult. So, what we're going to do? 
We want to make our malware as ready as possible to fight against all of that. We want our malware to be robust against those type of analysis. So what we're going to do, we're going to do malware armoring, which is like a generic term for any techniques or anything that we can do to delay or stop the analysis. But we all need to bear in mind that it's just to stay hidden as long as possible. If they are trained, if they have tools, they kind of always going to be able to find us. It's just, we are just implementing more things to get more time and to do whatever we have to do. So let's start with uh, a basic one, string encoding and encryption. Basically everything. Just if you have hard-coded data, if you have a hard-coded string, just encode and encrypt everything. Why? Because you don't want an antivirus from a static analysis that do static analysis to access your domain names that you're using for your redirected. You don't want, if you're using username and password to communicate back to your string infrastructure, that you get this information. So just encode and encrypt everything. In Windows, there's two API that are already uh, made for us because it's always a really bad idea to create all own crypto. Um, so there's a crypto API with the WinCrypt uh, that was deprecated. And now there's a next generation cryptographic API uh, with the Bcrypt, um, Bcrypt library. Uh, although something is important, uh, it's, it's, it's always better to use strong uh, encryption algorithm, like AES is always better than RC4. Uh, take more time to implement, of course, but it's always better. So this is an example um, of a project that, that, that I made a couple of weeks ago now, um, of a basic example of AES encryption with uh, um, uh, next generation cryptographic API, but roughly it's, 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 it's not too difficult because there's only five APIs to, to call. Uh, you can use the Bcrypt algorithm provider to actually ensure the, the, the next generation cryptography, um, API, and then you can use the Bcrypt generate symmetric key to create a, a symmetric key object with your IVN key. Uh, and then you, you call twice the crypt, uh, the bcrypt encrypt function to first get the, the size of your cyber text and then to actually encrypt the data. And, uh, at the end, for extra operational security, let's say, you can use bcrypt destroyed key to ensure that, uh, the key is no longer in memory if they are doing a memory dump of your process or the, of the system. Alright, so. Now let's talk about packers and cryptos, which are roughly the same thing. Uh, a packer with compressed data, a crypto with compressed and encrypt data, or just encrypt data. Uh, but they are roughly the same thing. Um, so there's two components, obviously the packer encryptor and the loader. And the idea is we're going to have an original PE file, which is, which is all my wolf, uh, all malicious file. And we're going to just compress all the section that I used to, to, to execute code, which are the text section. And if you're using resources, extra section, but we're going to pack that and encrypt that if we want. And, um, had a, another section, uh, on, for, for the most basic, let's say packer and crypto, we're going to have an extra section. We're going to modify the original entry point. Of a, of a, of a pair of a malware to jump into this extra section in which we're going to inject our loader. And this loader during runtime will be responsible for decrypting, um, and packing everything in memory. And we we'll also be responsible for, um, you know, modifying and updating all the input address table and export address table of the, uh, on the, on the PE header because everything is, is scrambled because of the, of the, because we packed everything, so we need to modify the PE header to, to be able to actually execute our code properly. Um, and after all that is done, well, the, the, the loader would just like uh, redirect and jump to the original entry point of our, of our code. Um, so while we're doing that, while we're doing that for signature-based detection, basically, uh, just to ensure that the actual malicious code that we're using is um, is just like a massive blob of data uh, that can't really be uh, understood by a static analysis. Um, we still need to bear in mind that at this point, uh, most AV are using uh, multiple signatures per uh, 405. So it's not just one signature 405, but it's for memory region uh, of a file. So if, if the packer and crypto use different keys every time, we ensure that the blob of data is always different. Um, but this is mostly what we're using. Originally, packers were used because uh, internet connection was way different than what it is to, today. Uh, so it was just to, to reduce the size of the file. All right, uh, polymorphism, uh, it's an interesting one. Um, so polymorphism is um, a, a specific type of encrypted malware. And the idea of polymorphism is we're going to ensure that for each iteration of a malware, we're going to always have different encryption settings. So if we are using AAS, it's going to be a different IV and a different key. And if we uh, are using uh, RSC4, for example, that's just going to be one key uh, or if 
it's like XOR encryption or whatever, it's going to be one key. Uh, but although the most important thing is like the decryption routine, the decryption routine that you're going to use will all, all the bit always different for each iteration of the malware. Um, so the actual encrypted part of the malware will always be the same. Uh, however, this is decryption routine and, and, and the decryption uh, setting that will be different. So all it works. So this is a, a roughly what a polymorphic engine do. So there are three major parts of the random generator that are going to be used uh, to, to select uh, arbitrary, uh, not necessarily arbitrary, but to select a register that will be used to decrypt. Uh, and we have junk code generator that are going to generate junk code that do nothing, and obviously that do not alter all actual code, and the decrypted generator. And the decrypted generator will use a template, so a pre-coded uh, loader, and we inject and modify this template with uh, arbitrary selected uh, registry um, and all the origin code. So this is uh, an example in, in assembly. So it's... Um, so roughly, we're putting a string in the SI register, register, and then the size of the string into the CX register, and then we are just going through every byte one by one, and we're doing a XOR operation. Um, and on, on the right, we have the exact same thing. At the end, that's going to be the same thing. However, there's different register that are going to hold the information, and all those is a lot of junk code that not that's going to do nothing. But from a, a static analysis point of view, here, this is a completely different code that's going to have a completely different signature. Um, and this is why we're using polymorphic in Uh Metamorphism. So metamorphism uh, is kind of the same as polymorphism, but on steroids. Um, so metamorphism, the idea is like the entire malware will be different for each iteration. Not only the AV, but the, the encryption settings and the, and the decryption routine. In this case, is literally your malware that's going to be different. It would do the same thing, but in terms of assembly code and what it is at the end, that's going to be different. So the problem with that, uh, with metamorphic and giant is like, it's extremely difficult to create. Um, that's the first problem. Uh, and roughly 80% of the malware, if the metamorphic engine is within the malware, uh, that's, that's probably going to be 80% of your malware to do that. So for both polymorphism and metamorphism, uh, nowadays we tend to do that in server side rather in, um, let's say, malware side. Uh, so exposing an API um, that's going to be used to say, oh, I want a new iteration of this malware. On the server side, we have all polymorphic and metamorphic engine that's going to regenerate the malware and send the, the new version to us. So we ensure that if we are caught or we lost somewhere, uh, or polymorphic engine, metamorphic engine, someone not going to be able to, to do reverse engineering and get access to, to, to what we're actually doing to, to, to mutate or, or, or malware. And although, because if the polymorphic and metamorphic engine are within the malware, uh, if, if we have that on server side, uh, we, we, we're going to end up with um, a malware that is uh, lightweight. We're, we're going to have something uh, with less code, so it's always going to be better. Um, so metamorphic engine, uh, roughly, this is an example of the work. So we have an infected process. So let's say this infected process is running on malware, and the metamorphic engine is within this. So what's going to happen? The first thing is to actually locate the entry point of the code. So I'm going to locate uh, the first bytes, the first operation of my code, and then from here I'm going to disassemble this code. And based on the on the on this code that I disassemble, I'm going to analyze it and generate some binary patterns. And on the binary patterns, I'm going to transform it. And once everything is transformed, I can either keep it like that, or I can create a new version of myself, encrypt it, and have this is both data sitting in, um, in, in the desk for persistent purposes or, or anything else. And then I'm going to uh, execute the remaining code of, of, my, of my malware. Uh, but at the end, this new version can be re reused and re executed. So uh, if you need to, spin, uh, to, to, create, uh, to spawn a new process, uh, you can use this new version, which will do the same again and again and again, uh, and you ensure that the signature will always be different. Um, so an example of metamorphism transformation. Uh, so there's four main techniques, uh, which are instruction substitution, register swapping, dead code insertion, and code flow modification. So we have the same example in assembly here. And uh, as we can see, this is completely different. However, again, going to do the same thing. So in terms of code flow modification, in this case, we have uh, two new uh, subroutines, which are uh, meta1 and meta2, that do literally nothing. It's just like dead code. However, we're going to jump uh, to meta1 and then meta2, and then we're going to keep doing that again and again. So we commonly modify the execution flow. We also have 
code that do nothing, dead code. Um, we also have registry, uh, register swapping because here we are not using the SI and S, uh, CX registers, but instead we're using uh, DX register, for example. Um, and we have all, all the instruction substitution. So instead of directly moving into the CX register the size of the string, instead of that, we're going to do some basic math with the add uh, operation code uh, to do it. So again, going to do the same, but it's completely different. All right, so um, last part, let's say, for all the static analysis techniques, or well, techniques that can be implemented against static analysis, is a multi which it, which is probably the most easiest technique to implement, which is quite useful, is as just leveraging the staging system. Uh, the, this first code that we're going to send to the to to the victim or to the target will not directly contain our code. So what we're going to do instead, we're going to execute multiple routines to assess whether or not it's safe to continue. It's safe to actually download the malicious code and execute it. Um, and, and, and once you download it, once you have that, you can execute it. So you can use P injection or allowing, you can use DL injection or just basic shellcode. You can just download your shellcode from a remote location then injecting into memory or in your own memory or into a remote process or process allowing or that kind of thing. But the idea is like we separate the actual code that's going to execute uh, and, and, the, and the malicious code that will be executed later on. All right. Okay, so execution guardrails, they know we are more into uh, techniques against um, dynamic analysis. So the idea of execution guardrails is any routine that we can implement uh, to assess whether or not we are being debugged, we are inside a sandbox, or a virtual machine, or being emulated. And, and, and this is, in my humble opinion, one of the most important things um, against defense evasion is to be able to get as much information as possible against the system during execution before doing anything else. So the first execution should be, I'm going to gather information about the system, I'm going to understand where am I, if I'm on the correct target, that can also be important, uh, with like um, domain keying or, or you know, like uh, environment keying thing. Um, and if it's safe to continue, because I know that I'm not going to be detected at this point, or it's pretty unlikely that I'm going to be detected, I'm going to continue. So to do that, we have multiple techniques being implemented. So DEL execution was well, not really useful nowadays, but uh, the idea is you can you know use slip function to circumvent the, the the sandbox timeout if they are using timeout, uh, which is not true anymore. Um, but you can also have like a virtual machine uh, environment detection uh, by just checking the system with like no name pipes. Uh, known drivers, maybe there's dealers, virtualization dealer. There's something that VirtualBox is doing, for example. There's a name, there's no name pipes and NDL that are on the desk. So if you check for them and they are here, it's probably because you're inside a, a VirtualBox environment. Uh, user detection, uh, it's uh, quite a popular one, but yeah, just check if there's actually a real user that is on the system. So you can check if the mouse is moving. You can check if there's any new window that are created or that kind of thing. Uh, CPU detection, number of CPU, CPU temperature, uh, hardware detection, the, star, the size uh, of the system storage. Uh, if it's a sandbox, uh, most of the time it's like smaller um, storage size rather than, uh, for uh, normal labs are probably going to be like uh, 1500 gigs or something like that. Um, but you can also check for the number of CPU core, uh, because when you, when you're inside a virtual environment, some, most of the time you have like a limited amount of, of CPU core. Um, environment detection, if there's no, uh, a known host name, a sandbox host name. So if you just check the host name and it's like the one of a, of a known sandbox, well, you already have your answer. Um, you can also check for a registry key for known install software. So if there's any software that installs through registry key, that kind of thing. Uh, debug detection, uh, where well, you can check the process environment block or the threat environment block to check if you're being debugged, or you can even uh, query and get the reg register trap flag from the, from the CPU. Uh, direct system calls. Uh, this is probably the second most uh, useful technique, I would say. Um, direct system calls. So, in Windows, there's multiple rings that separate the user and the kernel end. And when you want to create a file, when you want to use to do something on Windows, you're always going to end up using uh, the Windows API 
Uh, and the two Windows API, there is a documented one, which is uh, mostly in like kernel32.dir, user32.dir, ADV API, that kind of thing. Uh, this, is, this is a documented API, so you have documentation online, you can uh, you have examples and stuff, so you can use it. And in this example, if you use not to create a new file, they're going to be create file. So create file is... Um, Will be a macro, but if you're uh, using Unicode, it's going to be quite fine W. If you use ANSI, they're going to be quite fine A. And this this function, what what this function is going to do? This function is going to call a native Windows API, an undocumented Windows API, which is uh, within the ntdl.dll. And this function will be ntcreate file. And the ntcreate file, what it is, is just a wrapper around assembly code. And the assembly code in this case, or in like a, a basic Windows 10 environment, will be moved into the EAX register, this uh, hexadecimal code, which is 55, and then execute the system call operation code, which instruct the, uh, which instruct the CPU uh, to execute that. And then what ntdl, the DL are going to do, it would just like be responsible for the transition between the user and the kernel end. And on the kernel end, there is a structure called the System Service Dispatch Table, SSSD, where SSDT, that actually holds a key value pair table of kernel routing. So this table know that the system call 55 in, in hexadecimal points to the actual ZW create file function on the kernel side. We execute that, and the ZW create file function will execute whatever this function had to execute and send everything uh, to the IU um, input output a driver to do whatever it has to do and then send back everything uh, to, to, to the user. But why it's important to know that is because most of the AV and EDR nowadays, uh, if not all of them, are actually hooking userland Windows API. They're actually hooking userland Ring, the Earth, uh, Ring 3 Windows API. So if we are actually using this Windows API. They're going to have visibility on what we're doing. And if we're creating a new, a new, a new, a new process, and we inject something in this process, um, with like write process memory X or something like that, they're going to be able to intercept those data and say, oh, right, okay, this is Cobra shellcode, or this is Met Metasploit shellcode. This is definitely bad. And they're going to block the execution and, and, and yeah, they're just going to block the execution. So what we want to do at this point, we want to use Direct system calls to ensure that we're not using the Windows API and that therefore they have no, no visibility on what we're doing. Uh, there is a caveat, is like, the caveat is that some EDR are also doing kernel, um, kernel routines hooking. Um, but it's, yeah, we're probably not gonna, well, I'm not gonna talk about it, uh, here. So this is an example with Windows Debugger on all we can get this, uh, uh, this system calls. So you can uh, assemble a function with Windows API. So you load, uh, you load, um, um, a binary, uh, that use ntdl.dl and then, uh, you're gonna use the, uh, uf, uh, function to unassemble a function and get, and get the actual code. And here we can see that the nt create section, the, uh, system code is 44 in, in hexadecimal and for the nt open file, they're gonna be 33. So what here, what we can do with that? Well, we can redefine our own function. We can redefine our own a function prototype. Um, on, on the right, we have uh, the redefinition of the anti section and anti open file. And once we have all of that and we have all, all assembly code, well, we can actually execute it. And we can, uh, in this, in this case, that the first instruction for, for spawning a process with just um, direct system calls, we're going to first uh, open a file to get a handle to a file that we want to execute as an image. And we're going to use the anti section to create a, a section object that we're going to then use to, to spawn a process. But by doing that, we're not using the Windows API, we're re-implementing everything manually, basically, and therefore they have no visibility on what we're doing. All right. Um, command line spoofing. So the idea of command line spoofing is we want to execute command, but we don't want Windows to log it. So what we're going to do, we're going to create a suspended process with the create suspended flag, and then we're going to go through the process environment block of this uh, of this process, which holds all the information of this process, uh, knowing that the PEB uh, structure is actually coming from the kernel. And we're going to then update the RTL user process parameter structure, uh, which holds a Unicode string structure, which holds a uh, kernel structure. And we're going to modify it to actually modify the common line, uh, the, the, the length and the maximum length of this common line, and, and therefore we're going to be able to, to modify it for what Whatever we want. So this is another example in C++, where here, uh, just 
before this, let's say we just spawn a process, uh, a suspended process, then we're going to use the NT query information process to get the process environment block. From here, we're going to uh, read this, uh, the, the memory uh, to get the information, and we're going to modify everything uh, for an arbitrary uh, Common line, and, and we're also going to update the size and maximum size of this structure. And at the end, what's going to happen is like on the left, we have the, the, the initial command, which is, which is going to execute a basic PowerShell uh, command, um, with, oh, I'm not malicious. And this, Windows will log this, the event logs will log this common line. However, what the actual command that will be executed is on the right, and this will not be, will not be logged. So again, there's a caveat if they're using, uh, ever, uh, win, uh, Ah, it's um, Evan Trace. Ah, I never remember the name. Um, Evan Tracing for Windows. Yeah, if they're using Evan Tracing for Windows, they're going to be able to get access to all this information. But if they only rely on the on the Windows Evan logging, they're not going to get this information. Point process ID spoofing. Uh, so the idea of parent process ID spoofing is we want to break the parent child uh, relationship of the process. So Let's say you're within a Word or Office document, uh, Excel document, and you want to spawn a new process for doing all this stuff, right? The problem here is like if you just spawn bas a basic process, the parent of this new process will be Excel or Word. And for most EDR and AV, they're going to detect that as malicious because there's no legitimate reason for, 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 for Word or Excel to spawn a PowerShell process. So instead, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to create a new process and specify our own parent process ID. So the process is to uh, first identify and find the ID of a process by a name, and then to update the proc thread attribute list uh, of, of the um, startup information X structure uh, that then we're going to use to create a process. So how it works. Well, this is an example in, in, in C++ on how you can uh, get the, the process ID of a, of a process by name. So it leverages a tool help library to get a snapshot of the system of all the running process, go through them, uh, go through each of them, check the name, if this is the same name of the one that we want as a parent, and then we check that they're in the same session because if there's multiple users logged into the system, we want to be on the same session. So they saw they are doing that. Well, this is what the code is doing. And, and once we have this, uh, this uh, process ID, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use the... Ah, oh, that's pretty difficult to read there. Uh, we're going to use the initial proc uh, thread attribute list. So we're going to ensure this process attribute list. Then we're going to use uh, the update proc attribute list with all the information, which is the under of our parent. And we're going to pass that... Um, to the startup information X uh, structure, and then we're going to pass to the create process function. And, and therefore, by doing that, we're going to have any, any parent we want. And in this example, uh, when we execute the code, the current process ID of the running process is 96776. Uh, However, on the new process that was spawned, which is a PowerShell, uh, a PowerShell process, we can see that the parent is explored at exe with pro process ID 8452. So, yes, you can, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so domain fronting, uh, so know that's the last part of the talk. That's going to be about like communication uh, security, uh, kind of. Um, so domain fronting, used for years now, probably. Uh, but the idea of domain fronting is we're going to leverage a website to redirect our traffic for us. So why it's useful? Well, because it's useful to bypass domain reputation check, domain H check, and DNS whitelisting. If we create this, oh, I'm not malicious.com website, and we reject our traffic to it, the EDR and all the endpoint, uh, all the security product that they're using, they're going to say, all right, this, this domain name was created like two days ago. And I don't know it. This uh, the average reputation or a bad one. So it's going to just deny the traffic. And because this is the, this is the domain that we're using for C2 communication, well, we'd, we just lose access. So what we're going to do, we're going to use domain fronting. And how it works. We're going to use a really trusted and, and, and nice uh, domain, like uh, ajax.microsoft.com. And when we're going to... Uh, so ajax.microsoft.com is actually a domain that we can use for domain fronting. And what we're going to do, we're going to modify the host header of the request that we are sending to specify all actual uh, 
domain name for our redirector. And what's going to happen is like when Ajax and Microsoft.com receive this request, you're going to, you're going to just forward it to the host which you are providing. So they're going to kindly, for us, just redirect all the traffic to this, to, to, to our domain. Uh, the problem with domain fronting is like if they're using TLS interception, uh, they're going to have access to this uh, host header and they're all they're going to be able to, to, to block the communication. So instead of domain fronting, why not just uh, leveraging and abusing content delivery network CDN? In this case, we don't even have to specify a host header. We just need to specify the CDN uh, endpoint and the CDN will do everything for us because it's based on all we're going to configure it. Uh, the, the only thing to, 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 to check is to always set to zero the required time to live because CDN uh, are supposed to cache data, so we don't want that, otherwise we're going to lose communication. So just set the TTR to zero and you're good to go, you're going to receive all your, all your data. And the cool thing about that, although, is like there's a lot of free services that are offering CDN, so you can use Amazon CloudFront, you can use Azure, and there's others. And roughly how it looks, well, I just create my CDN, I get uh, a URL, and on my Azure dashboard, on my uh, AWS dashboard, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to configure this URL to points to my C2 server, which are two points to my first server that I'm going to use to deploy my malware. And I just need to communicate to this trusted domain, which is CloudFront.net. And CloudFront.net will just do everything for us, which is great. And last one. Broadcast HTTP or HTTPS, actually. Um, so the idea of that is just to make noise. When we can, just make noise. Uh, mimic a real traffic, confuse network analyzers, uh, call multiple websites, like 50, 60 different websites, and in the middle of this website, just like call, call yours that is used to, to, for, for, C, for your C2 infrastructure. And what's going to happen is like if someone is actually detect your, your malware and they, they analyze it, where well, they're going to probably spend a good amount of time to go through every single request one by one and, and look at the domains to, 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 to check uh, whether or not they're, they're, they're malicious. Um, so it's a, it's a good technique too. So roughly this is uh, everything uh, that we covered, so quite a lot of things. So now it's uh, time to, to conclude. So. <clears throat> I don't have anything else to add on these techniques, uh, but there's a couple of things that I really want to highlight for uh, at the conclusion. It's like, this is a cat and mouse game. Uh, this is a really, uh, that's an endless battle. That's never gonna end. Uh, the red team need the blue team, the blue team need the red team. We are working, uh, we need each other's, and the more sophisticated attacker are, the more sophisticated defender will be. And this is how it works. They find, and they build detection mechanism, we find ways to bypass them, and this is how it works. So the first thing. The second thing is, at the end of the day, you're going to be able to bypass things if you have the right amount of intel and information. One of the most important things is to blend in. If you're able to blend in, you're probably going to bypass defense mechanism. If you know which EDR they are using, if you know which AV they are using, you can replicate the same environment and work on it again and again until you find something that you can't detect. So information is extremely important. Uh, having a lot of intel about the, the, the targets will most likely help you having undetectable malwares or, or techniques that you can implement uh, for the specific environment. Again, if, for example, you know that they're using VBScript or PowerShell or any specific technology for inter-system communication or management, well, use it, because it's going to look like legitimate traffic, like if any, any sysadmin is actually working. So just blend in, basically. And although something that is important, it's to, to step back and, and to understand that we don't always need to be sophisticated. We don't always need to build uh, really sophisticated malware that implement a lot of things. Sometimes even basic things still works. And, 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 and if you want to build really sophisticated malware, well, you're going to have to spend time and energy on it. So it's completely up to you. But again, as written, the machine dictated the target and the target dictated the weapon. So just take time to think whether or not you need to spend time on it to build something sophisticated, or if just by using something already known, like for example, Cobra Strike, basic Cobra Strike payloads are still working great, and if you just modify them slightly, it still works. So the overall um, conclusion of this talk is 
if you're able to improvise and adapt to the situation, you're always going to be able to overcome and bypass the defense mechanism. Thank you. So, any of you have a, a question? Or you want to go to lunch now? Pardon? What, what, what do you mean? Like, build. Uh, I mean, that's, that's really depend on, on again on the target and what you need. Uh, you can reuse code when when you can reuse code. You can reuse infrastructure. Um, that's not necessarily a good a good thing to do. But um, especially if you use code infrastructure, right? You can just uh, just destroy everything and restart from scratch with uh, quite quickly with with Terraform or Ansible scripts and stuff like that. Um, but again, yeah, that's really depend on, on what you have to do and, and the maturity of the of the of the target. I think this is the most important thing: the maturity really going to dictate whether or not you need to spend time um, on building something custom or not. If that answers your question, or not? Yep. Um, I see with the, the sandbox section so quite important. Do you ever get false positives? So, like, someone Looking for a virtual machine and stuff, maybe they're using Citrix, or if you're looking yeah. for a mouse, maybe they're not using the mouse at that point. Yeah, so uh, the, the reason why, when you do that, you want not to implement a single uh, routine. You want to in implement uh, multiple routines and based on that, assess whether or not it's, it's, it's being virtualized or not. Or not. So uh, only one is not reliable. You need to implement multiple. And uh, based on that, I say, all right, there's a score of like, Five uh, on top of ten or whatever, and, and based on that you you check or you, you continue to execute or not. So yeah, implement multiple multiple routines. Yep. Uh, to burn thing. Uh, you mean like cleaning things that are already on the system, or when you. Yeah, so the, I, th I think this is also an important part. You don't want to leave any artifacts. So if you have a way to actually delete everything, uh, it's, it's always great to have, to have a, a function in, inside your malware that can just delete everything, uh, remove. If, if you modify the, the environment just to remove everything back to normal, um, this is an important thing, yeah. I, I mean, the, if, if you don't leave any artifact on a system that's going to be extremely difficult for them because if they don't have forensic information um, and all the logs of the previous uh, events and activities, it's, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult for a SOC team to actually uh, identify what, what happened. So, yeah, removing everything is always a good, good thing to do. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, you can. I mean, uh, again, the thing is, like, it's it's, it's an overview of the, of the techniques, but you, you you can you can do it. Yeah, but you can also do it on, at some point on the server side. If, for example, you know that uh, something that Sunbox are doing is like when they are downloading remote content, uh, they they used to have like uh, a, they can have like specific uh, user agents, or they can have like uh, IDs on the URLs to track that. Um, so you can just deny anything that is not. Uh, the normal request that is going to your infrastructure. So you can overdo that on your, on your infrastructure side. Uh, if, if there's any new, uh, parameters on the euro that are sent, uh, you know that it's not, it's not your malware that's actually doing it. So you can do that kind of thing on server side too.
Uh, I think if that's if all the questions done, then that's us heading over for lunch at Bar One, just next to where we registered in the morning. So I'd like to say thank you very much to Paul.